Buy your stat 66111 Skills for the rest of your life Bootstraps and probability It's the bread and butter, baby, what's your jam? Welcome Bio 6611. In this lecture, we're going to introduce and discuss some other common continuous distributions we'll see this semester, including the chi-squared f and t distributions. Let's start off with the chi-squared distribution. Let's start with looking at the chi-squared distribution's relationship to the normal distribution. The first thing to note is what I'm calling the chi-squared distribution here, you may also see called just the chi-squared distribution or written with its Greek term chi-squared uh, in a given different context. And these are all the same distribution we're talking about. Now, the chi-squared distribution has this parameter for k degrees of freedom. And with k degrees of freedom, we can say its relationship with a standard normal random variable is that it will be the sum of the squares of k independent and identically distributed, or IID, standard normal random variables. In other words, if we assume that we have these standard normal random variables z1 up to zk, then if we define a random variable to be the sum of each one of these separate independent and identically distributed random variables z1 through zk all squared, this will be distributed actually as a chi-squared distribution with those k degrees of freedom. So what is the degrees of freedom and what does it really mean in this context? Well, in general, the degrees of freedom represents the number of values in the final calculation of a statistic that are free to vary, or we can use to estimate other parameters still. In the chi-squared case, there are k numbers that are free to vary. In other words, we have z1 up to zk. The shape then of the chi-squared distribution will change as its degrees of freedom changes as well. Now, why is the chi-squared distribution important or useful? Well, it turns out it's one of the most widely used distributions in inferential statistics. In other words, to actually calculate things like confidence intervals and p-values for hypothesis testing or conducting a test for a goodness of fit or independence or to compare models. It also, as we'll see later on, is the distribution of the sample variance, and it's not as often applied though in the direct modeling of natural phenomena. A lot of times it comes about as one of the statistical theories sort of behind the scenes of distributions that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting. It also can represent an important component of both the T and the F distributions we're talking about later in this lecture set of slides. But as I mentioned, as the degrees of freedom k changes, we get different shapes for the probability density function of our distribution. And so we see that with the figure at the right here, whereas the degrees of freedom increases from one up to nine, we see that it ranges from this sort of yellow line there that goes straight sort of down with no real sort of peak, so to speak, to ones that actually start towards zero, go up and then down and in between these different vari uh, variations. So if we have a random variable and we do say or assume that it's chi-squared distributed with k degrees of freedom, we can note that the first thing is that the sample space for our random variables, the observations that we might take from it, must be uh, from zero up to infinity, so they cannot be negative valued. And we can note here for the chi-squared distribution, it actually has a very nice calculation for the expected value of invariance, where the expected value of a chi-squared distributed random variable x is equal to k, and the variance is equal to 2 times k. Now, here's an example problem you can work with on this slide here, where we're going to assume that y sub i represents um, a random variable that's from a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared. Now you can try to construct a new random variable x from our y sub i's from 1 up to y sub n, such that x is shown to be a chi-squared distributed random variable with n degrees of freedom. And here we'll assume that we know both mu and sigma squared. So if you want, I'd say pause this law presentation here to try working through some of the math on your own before we walk through the solution and steps on the next slide. Okay, so let's walk through the steps here. 
So what we first need to do to get back to sort of the context we're familiar with, the, the standard normal distribution being squared and the sum of that being a chi-squared random variable, is we first need to standardize our normal random variables so that they are not this normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared, but mean zero and variance one. We can do this here by taking our yi and first transforming to our z sub i uh, random variables here. So we'll take each observation random variable y sub i minus mu divided by its standard deviation sigma. By doing this, we then know we actually have that standard normal random variable with a expectation or a mean of zero and a variance of one. Now, using the z's that we've taken and transformed from our original y's, we can construct x as we did before as the sum of our z distributed random variables squared. And so therefore, with our previous facts that we stated, we can then state that x, the sum of these squared standard normal random variables, follow a chi-squared distribution with n degrees of freedom. So let's now pivot to take a look at a different continuous distribution known as the F distribution. As we mentioned before, the chi-squared is a component of this distribution, and so it's actually the ratio of two different chi-squared random variables scaled by their degrees of freedom. And simply by scaled, we mean if we look here in our definition below, we're going to divide by that degrees of freedom. Now, it has two parameters because we have two chi-squared random variables we're working with, k1 and k sub 2. In other words, if we assume that we have two random variables here, u sub 1 is a chi-squared distribution with k sub 1 degrees of freedom, and u2 is going to be a chi-squared distribution with k sub 2 degrees of freedom, then if we define a new random variable x as that ratio of our u1 divided by its degrees of freedom, and likewise the u2 divided by its degrees of freedom, what we actually can say is that we have x is distributed as an f distribution with k1, k2 degrees of freedom. So why is the f distribution important or useful to note here at this point before we move forward throughout the rest of the semester? Well first, much like the chi-squared distribution, it's actually fairly widely used. As we saw, it can be summarized as the distribution of those chi-squareds, but can also be used to describe the distribution of the ratio of those two independent estimators of population variances. We'll also see it come up as a test for the equality of variances between two independent normal samples. They'll show up in the uh, analysis of variance ANOVA approach, as well as in regression, and in various tests that have been derived for comparing different models and to select which one may be more or less appropriate for a given data set. Some details of the F distribution. Um, if we assume that, again, our random variable is F distributed, much like the chi-square distribution, those realizations of the distribution must be between zero and infinity, so no negative observed values. We see that it's a little more complicated than the chi-square distribution to calculate the expectation and variance, but we do see we have these uh, general closed forms we can use in certain contexts um, to calculate those values. And we do see as well at the figure at the right here that depending on our combinations of the degrees of freedom, here denoted d1 and d2 instead of k1 and k2, we have different shapes for that distribution. So by tweaking these degrees of freedom, we can change the shape that we're looking at to have different qualities and effects that may look more like some of those chi-squared distributions we saw before with these colored lines or something that is vaguely normal-ish looking uh, at least having that sort of peak there, like this gray line, has the degrees of freedom get much larger. So the final distribution we're going to introduce and briefly discuss is the T distribution, or also called student's T distribution. Let's start by looking at the relationship between the sample mean, the sample variance, and the T distribution. So again, we're going to start by assuming we have a series of random variables y sub 1 up to y sub n, they're independent and identically distributed as normal with a mean mu and a variance sigma squared. So we can define or calculate the sample mean and sample variance as we normally would, with where we have y bar is equal to the sum of each of our random variables y divided by our sample size and our sample variance. 
we'll calculate as the sum of the squares of the difference of yii and the sample mean divided by n minus 1. Now with these definitions for the sample mean and the sample variance, we can then write x as a new random variable in the form of y bar minus mu divided by s over the square root of n. So in other words, the sample mean minus the population mean, all of that divided by the sample standard deviation, or the square root of what we calculated up here above, divided by the square root of n. Now, we would say that this term is distributed as a t distribution with n minus 1, or in other words, x has a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So again, you might be wondering, well, where does this degrees of freedom come from, this n minus 1 term? Well, in this case, it comes from the case that if we calculate and therefore know y bar, it follows that if we then add up all of our observed random variables, let's say y1 up to yn, well, if we subtract from that n times y bar, we know that that's going to equal 0 based on the definition of the sample mean. So therefore, if we know n minus 1 of the values of y, so maybe we know up these first ones, y1 up to yn minus 1, we could then figure out what that missing yn term has to be in order to make this equality or this statement above hold true. In other words, since we've already estimated the sample mean, we've spent one of our degrees of freedom in fixing that quantity in the estimation or calculation of the statistic. So where does the t distribution show? We've discussed where it arises in the case of a chi-squared and f distribution, but for the t distribution, we'll see it come up a lot as well because it arises in cases where we estimate the mean of a normally distributed population, but we have a small sample size and we aren't comfortable assuming a known true standard deviation. We want to estimate it from the sample like we did before where we calculated s squared for the sample variance and then took its square root. We'll also see it arise when we're looking at testing and confidence intervals for the difference between two sample means using a t-test, for various tests of significance in linear regression and other regression approaches, as well as when we do Bayesian analysis of data where we make certain assumptions about the normal family of distribution. The t-distribution in the way we've described and defined it will always have a mean of zero and the variance here um, with its degrees of freedom as calculated. And we'll see here that it's mimicking then that sort of standard normal distribution where as our degrees of freedom get bigger and go to positive infinity, we'll actually converge in distribution to a normal distribution. But again, for smaller degrees of freedom, we'll actually have fatter tails than we would if we compared to a normal distribution. As a final little closing story, you might wonder as well, well, where did the name student's t-distribution come from? It was actually derived and developed by a statistician who was named William Seeley Gossett, so not student, and he published it in a, this paper proposing and describing the t-distribution in the journal Biometrica under a pseudonym known as student. Now, Gossett worked at Guinness Brewery in Dublin, Ireland, and he was interested in some small sample problems, such as the chemical properties of barley when he was looking at the brewing of the beer. Now, there isn't necessarily a for sure known reason why he used student as the pseudonym, but it's been said that Guinness perhaps preferred staff to use pen names when publishing scientific papers, or Guinness didn't want competitors to know they had derived this new distribution specifically to look at to determine the quality of ingredients perhaps more efficiently or precisely than they had with other assumed distributions they may have been using. So a bit of a mystery maybe still that we won't ever necessarily know, but an interesting backstory to the name of students for students' t-distribution. And with that, we will close our lecture about the named continuous distributions we will encounter somewhat frequently throughout the rest of the semester in 6611.